So we're going to start with the lecture, uh, Innovation and Culture, the Scientific Method. This is lecture number five. And as mentioned, the first half of this course is about the fundamentals and history of, uh, of innovation. And uh, last week we did history of innovation in Korea. And uh, this week we will do innovation and the scientific method. And of course, the second half of the course is about methods and applications of uh, innovation. So the first question, and we'll ask a few people uh, for their uh, thoughts, is what is science? Anybody want to say what is their definition of science? So Pak Min Ji, Pak Min Ji, what is science? Um, Any thoughts? What is science? How would you define science? What does science mean to you? Okay, how about uh, Kim Do Kyung? Kim Do Kyung, what do you think? What is science? Uh, I think science is to create something new or figure out some phenomena. Okay, how would that be different than art? I mean, art creates something new and art also tries to uh, understand the, you know, represent uh, emotions or reality. Um, science is focused on some life, life or in artists um, coverage um, many things than okay science. uh thank you kim do kyung and how about last one kim cho rin kim cho rin what do you think what is science um i think science is to discover something new and make it useful or helpful to humans okay but that sounds like the definition of innovation. And of course, science doesn't always have to be applied, uh, the practical aspects. We will talk about that in this lecture, but uh, uh, that, you know, science doesn't always have to have practical application. So let's actually proceed. Thank you, Kim Cho Uh We'll quickly review last week's lecture about innovation in Korea. Uh, as you remember, we had, not last week, but the previous lecture, we had uh, two rankings. And so by the Bloomberg ranking, South Korea was actually number one. And those were based on a number of sources and they used seven criteria. And many of those criteria actually were perfectly aligned for Korea and in particular, perfectly aligned for Samsung, which takes a big proportion of the uh, economy and uh, uh, innovation in Korea. So uh, some other countries coming up and the uh, United States dropping, et cetera. So this is one uh, ranking of innovation. Another ranking by the World Economic Forum did not put Korea even in the top uh, uh, 10. It was uh, actually lower down 23 or something like that. And Switzerland was number one. And this was based on 12 criteria of competitiveness, uh, more broadly construed. And so this highlighted how innovation, we can kind of understand it. We spent the first lecture uh, defining it in a fair amount of detail and all its different 
types of innovation and so forth, the different dimensions of innovation. But in reality, even though we can have a good idea and define it, to measure innovation is very difficult. And in the second half of the course, we will have more uh, lectures and more uh, discussion about how to measure innovation, because that's very important. As Galileo said, if you can't measure it, you, uh, it's not science and you want to make something that you can't measure actually measurable. So um, this is a big challenge. We discussed last time several selected innovations in Korean history, the heated uh, greenhouse, the water gauge, the mechanical water clock, uh, Hangul language, which we had a holiday last week for, movable type uh, and underfloor heating or ondo. And then we discussed about Kim Sejong and Jang Yong Shil. Kim Sejong created a uh, environment that encouraged a lot of innovation and enabled a lot of innovation. And there were three features of that environment. One was breaking down class barriers so that uh, a variety of people could contribute their ideas and not just elite aristocrats or royal members. Second was a meritocracy uh, modeled on the Chinese system where people took exams to get into high positions. And third was the dissemination of knowledge in particular by the development of Hangul. If you look at these three social phenomena of breaking class barriers, meritocracy, and dissemination of knowledge, you, you see that they fit directly with the evolutionary framework we describe for evolution. So in, in evo, uh, for innovation. So in evolution, we have uh, heritability of fitness or the genetics to pass on the information. And that's the dissemination of knowledge. We have the phenotypic variability or different ideas and that's the breaking of the class barrier. So not just one type of people had the ideas. And then we have the meritocracy, which is the differential fitness or the testing of those ideas, the testing of those genes and phenotypes with the real world. So those are the three factors that are social factors, but they fit perfectly with this concept of evolution, biological evolution as a framework for uh, innovation. So uh, then we have Jang Yong Shil, which was kind of the Korean Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, again, born outside of the aristocracy, had many discoveries, which we described some of them. And then of course, we discussed how in the end he was pushed out by all the jealousies and the dramas and uh, politics that uh, is common in many cases when people are innovative and uh, people get jealous or they don't like it. Things that are different are very threatening to societies and individuals. So that's a tragedy. And of course, that still persists today. There's a lot of pressure to uh, conform to expected behavior, expected ideas. And so even though we say we wanna be very innovative, in reality, is it extremely difficult to do that because of this social pressure? And that was true back then, even though uh, King Sejong had developed a framework to, or a, uh, a, a culture to get over that, uh, obviously that's very difficult to completely eliminate. And it's true today as well. So now we go to the main part of the lecture. We're going to talk about science, the scientific method, inductive versus deductive reasoning, uh, the relationship between innovation, creativity, and science with Albert Einstein and science and technology. Uh, Kim Cho Rin was talking about the practical aspects of science. And to some extent, they are separate, but also integral together. Uh, then we'll give some case examples, uh, which will be in the notes we may not cover in detail in this lecture. So what is science? It is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of physical and natural world through observation and experiment. So key uh, words or key points are it's an activity. So science is not just the, the, the knowledge, but it's actually the process of getting the knowledge 
we call that more specifically the scientific method. So it's an activity. Another key word is systematic. So there's a sort of uh, system or logic to this process. And then it's the physical and natural world. So basically the reality, whether it's physics or biology. And the last two words are very critical, observation and experiment. Uh, so some way of testing that idea with the natural world. So you can see there are close connections between innovation and uh, science. This concept of uh, <clears throat> having lots of different ideas, testing those ideas through observation and experiment and getting the best ideas or validating those ideas is similar process to innovation. So what I wanna to emphasize today is not so much science as innovation in terms of science uh, results being innovation, but the science process being related to innovation. Now in the book Waves, uh, which we'll have separate lectures as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of description about the scientific method, about how Thomas is doing the experiments and how is he's doing the clinical trials. He may be uh, testing in animals and he wants to test in people and so on and so forth. There's a systematic process of that testing of his ideas. So of course that's in a literary context, but he's doing science as a process, very similar to this definition. So as I mentioned, science is not a body of knowledge per se, but it's more of a process and that's embodied by the scientific method. And it's a circular process. It doesn't have a beginning and an end, but it's always happening both societally and with individuals. So it begins, roughly speaking, with making an observation. And one of the assignments in this class, final assignments, will be about observation. You'll need to write a short paper about some observation that you make uh, and why it is interesting uh, and why you uh, would like to talk about it and what are the implications of that observation. That ability to observe something interesting and then to think about it is a very critical first step in the scientific method. So based on those observations, you think of interesting questions, then you formulate the hypotheses. Uh, we'll talk about what a hypothesis is. In other words, it's a guess about uh, what that observation means. And from that hypothesis, you develop testable predictions, which uh, are basically experiments. You gather data to test those predictions and then you develop general theories and those general theories will then inform further observations. So then you go into that cycle again. So what is a scientific hypothesis? Well, it starts with a fact, again, this observation about the world, whether it be uh, biology, physics, chemistry, whatever. Uh, and then a hypothesis or multiple hypotheses are generated. Uh, an intervening step is sort of thinking of questions and so forth and implications and then generating hypothesis. Now, a key uh, distinction between a hypothesis and an opinion is the hypothesis must be falsifiable. There must be a way to test the hypothesis. The hypothesis must have a practical implication uh, in terms of a possible experiment. And then of course, as the hypothesis is validated, a theory is uh, developed, which is a collection of hypotheses that are been tested to be valid. And then a mathematical embodiment of that theory would be a law. So uh, why don't you give some examples? We'll go to uh, the class examples of a hypothesis. So for example, uh, Kim Do Kyung, Kim Do Kyung. What is an example of a hypothesis? Yes. Kim Do Kyung. What would be an example of a hypothesis? What do you, what would be an example?
Okay, how about we go with uh, uh, e urim, e urim. What is an example of a hypothesis? Oh, uh, evolutionary theory. Well, that's not a hypothesis. That's a whole theory. Uh, so that's just a, a big theory. Uh, what would be an example of a hypothesis? So how about uh, Kong Yong J? Kong Yong J. What's an example of a hypothesis? And how about uh, An Song Jun? An Song Jun. What's an example of a hypothesis? Mm, what is this? Oh, Men Mendel? Mendel? Biology. Uh, these are theories. Remember we said a theory is different than a hypothesis. A theory is a validated hypothesis. Mm. So a hypothesis is a guess. We're not guessing about Mendel. We're not guessing about evolution. Doesn't mean they're perfectly correct, but these are not hypotheses. So I'll give you an example of a hypothesis. Uh, do people want to live forever? Do people want to live forever? That would be a hypothesis. It's a kind of question. Or rather the hypothesis would be that's the question. The hypothesis would be people don't want to live forever. Right? It's not a theory. It's, it's a question. We don't know the answer to that. How do we test the hypothesis? Well, we make a survey. We ask people what their opinion is. Because the question is, do people want to live forever? And the hypothesis is, we don't believe people want to live forever because life has less meaning, there's nothing to do, it gets boring and so forth. And in the earlier part of the lecture, in the discussion period with Dr. Park's uh, book, we actually tested that hypothesis. We tested that hypothesis by making the Google Doc and asking the question. And the majority of people, most people, almost everybody said they don't want to necessarily live forever. So that's a hypothesis. It's related to a question on a specific unknown answer. And we have a mechanism or a system to test that answer. So a hypothesis is not a theory. A hypothesis is still a guess. Uh, now, you, now developing a hypothesis is actually almost like an art form. This is one reason why science and art go together because there's no formula. There's no equation how to make a hypothesis. It's like a painter or a musician making a beautiful melody or a beautiful painting. There are some uh, basics and some technical aspects to that, but ultimately there's an artistic aspect. What is the perfect hypothesis? It needs to be not too big, not too small, easily tested, connected to existing theories. It has to be important, but not so huge. These are judgments and not uh, technical uh, sort of something you can do with an algorithm and just spit out and create a hypothesis. It sounds very easy, just guessing about what the world is like, but that formulating that guess in a way that is testable with an experiment is actually requires a lot of uh, ability, intelligence, and in fact, as I mentioned, art. So the essence of science is a hypothesis. So some of you in your answer were confusing hypothesis versus theory. So a hypothesis is a proposed explanation based on limited evidence. So 
it's uh, some sort of description or explanation of reality as a guess proposed. And a theory is an idea or a set of ideas that is intended to explain the facts or events based on validated hypotheses. The hypothesis is not scientifically proven uh, or tested, and a theory is scientifically tested or proven. So Mendel's laws are not hypotheses. Now, Mendel's laws can lead to some hypotheses based on unknown phenomena, but Mendel's laws on its own are not hypotheses. So typically, a hypothesis is also based on some limited realm of data, whereas a theory is based on a wide range of uh, data uh, as a result of all these hypotheses being validated. And a hypothesis can lead to a theory so for example, Mendel had a hypothesis that when he mixed the peas together, that uh, some will have the traits and some will not have the traits. And some will have the traits in a uh, 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 dominant way and some will have it in a recessive way based on his theory. And so he did some tests that these particular plants will if he mixed them with a dominant gene, that they'll have a dominant pattern. If he mixed it with a recessive gene, they'll have a recessive pattern. And so he developed hypotheses to test that theory. Uh, and the theory, as I mentioned, can be formulated through a hypothesis. Another concept in uh, science is the distinction between inductive and deductive thinking. So inductive theory, uh, thinking, comes from observation, leads to a hypothesis, which when validated leads to a theory. So that is a kind of synthetic knowledge. You build something new from existing facts. Deductive thinking is you have a theory and you analyze and you expect certain observations and you confirm them. So both of these, and central to both of these is the hypothesis. So you can have an inductive hypothesis based on ob observation and a deductive hypothesis based on theory. And both of these are involved in science. So what about art? What is art? So Paul Clay, the Swiss painter, art does not represent the visible, rather it makes it visible. And Pablo Picasso says, we all know that art is not truth, which I disagree with, but art is a lie that makes us realize the truth. So uh, in a sense, it's one part of the truth. It's the uh, convincing and the understanding and the feeling for that truth. And science, in a sense, is the uh, systematic development of that truth. So as I mentioned, as you know, in the book Ways, we talk about this book, like all art is true, and this book, like all art is falsifiable. So the concept of being able to test the hypothesis and actually prove it wrong is a, the central differentiator of science. Art is not something that can be falsifiable. Art is what it is. You can't say it's correct or it's wrong. It is the experience of the artist of that reality. Uh, but in a sense, it's that experience, it's the feeling what Pablo Picasso described as the realization of the truth that actually makes it the truth for that person. And that person, that artist is trying to communicate that to uh, the rest of the world. So Einstein, we talked about this quote, after a certain high level of technical skill, which all of you have based on your taking the exams and so forth. After that, science and art tend to come together. They coalesce in aesthetics or beautiful theory plasticity and the changing and the form. And as I mentioned, the hypothesis is not just a formula, but it's something that comes out of an artistic sense of what re reality should be. And the greatest scientists are always artists as well. And that's what we're trying to encourage uh, in this class. So another interesting concept is that of science or technology. Uh, this is uh, someone very famous, you may not know him, but he's Vannevar Bush, and he was uh, the uh, director of the Office of uh, uh, Scientific Research for the U.S. government at the end of World War II, 
and the post-war, early post-war period. And he created a report to the president called Science, the Endless Frontier, which was very influential. It, Digist is established based on these principles. Uh, the American health, the American academic system is based on these uh, principles. How science is done very much was based on how this was developed. And uh, Vannevar Bush made a distinction between basic research and applied research. And basic research should be very separate and applied research should be uh, also separate. Basic research should be in the universities applied research should be in the uh, companies or in industry. Basic research should be funded by government and applied research should be funded by uh, commercial funds. And this separation was, uh, is, and continues to be an important part of how science is done. But as I've, as you know, this is a convergence course and it's about convergence and these separations, this artificial separation is less valuable these days. Uh, the world of business and the world of academia are more connected. Basic research and applied research come together. Science and art must, in the best of science and art, come together. So I wanted to give a little history of that separation. Uh, and the separation is not something that's a law, but is created in a sense by people for convenience, for politics, or for uh, the situation at that time. Uh, it doesn't mean that at that time Vannevar Bush was wrong, but the world has changed and we need more of this convergence. Now I should say that it's not just in the present world, but uh, in history, uh, science and applied research have come together. So as you know, Albert Einstein is the sort of example of pure science. Uh, his theory of relativity is very abstract. It talks about the relativity of space and time because of the constancy of the speed of light. And uh, many people consider, even though there are practical applications now, essentially this is very abstract, pure science, almost mathematical. But in fact, Einstein developed these theories, the relativity theory in particular, when he was not an academic, not in pure research, but he was a clerk in the patent office in Bern in Switzerland. And this is a picture of him uh, and this is a picture of the patent office. And he wrote that working on the final formulation of technological patents was a veritable blessing for me. It enforced many sided thinking and also provided important stimuli to physical thought. So that's very interesting. How is Einstein's theories influenced by this practical experience in the patent office? Well, it turns out that there were two major technologies in Switzerland or in the world at that time. There were many technologies, but two of them, they were coming together. One was rail technology, railways, uh, trains. The other one was electricity. And in order to get the trains on time and, and uh, in a good schedule, predictable schedule, that meant that the clocks in all the stations had to be synchronized. They had to have the clock in Geneva, the clock in Bern, the clock in Zurich, the uh, clock in Basel, all these Swiss cities synchronized. And that was combining electrical signals, of course, to synchronize um, train technology. So two technologies coming together. And at that time, uh, many patents came in on how to synchronize those clocks perfectly. So Einstein is thinking, what does it mean to synchronize clocks? And of course, he's thinking not just of the patent and the practical aspect, but he's also thinking of the scientific implications. So the point is that this technologies stimulated basic science, whereas Vannevar Bush and many of the current ways of working have science stimulating technology science leads to technology, but technology can also lead to new science. Uh, it goes both ways. So this is the Bern uh, clock tower. This is the electrical network that was being described between the different uh, stations and uh, other places. And so synchronizing those was a very important problem, practical problem in those days. 
So he was not just a technologist though. Uh, the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and true science. Uh, I am reading a biography right now of Galileo. And uh, as you know from Waves, uh, the Ritmo or the dialogue section is a, a literary form that Galileo used. Uh, and he was very much also trying to combine science and art. And of course, with Galileo is the beginning of our modern physics uh, that, you, that you know, we're gonna discuss that in the Waves lecture. So that is uh, today's lecture. Uh, any questions?